Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Kuhn, and I'm going to be walking you through uh, what we're doing with Creo Illustrate 7.0. Uh, this is scheduled to be released uh, the second week of June. Uh, so with that, um, and to, to start off with, I apologize. Normally, I do live demos with my presentation, but uh, just before we started today, my power went out. So <laughs> uh, Melissa is kind enough to advance the slides for me, and I'm just going to be speaking to the slides today. So uh, apologies for that. So with that, uh, first up, we have uh, attributes. So Creo Illustrate now has what we call the direct connection, which means you can connect to Windchill without uh, the requirement of using a workgroup manager. Now, one of the things that that meant was that you couldn't uh, create attributes when you were checking in a file. Uh, it was a much simpler capability, uh, and it was designed to be simpler to begin with. Uh, but as more and more customers are using the direct connection, uh, we've been getting more and more requests for some of the advanced features that uh, the workgroup manager used to have. So with that, we've added the ability that when you uh, first check in a file uh, from Creo Illustrate into Windchill, it will take you to the Windchill page automatically so that you can fill in whatever attributes are necessary. So the, the same rules still apply. Those The attributes that you want to have your illustrators filling in already need to uh, be created in Windchill itself. We are just taking you to the page that would allow them to access those attributes and fill in that information. Uh, now this is optional. Uh, you can see in the, the top little picture there, uh, towards the bottom of the Windchill stuff, there's uh, the ability to edit attributes on first save. If you turn that on, then Creo Illustrate will take you to the attributes page uh, when you first check it in. And that's pretty much it for that one. So next slide, please. So with this one, we have an update to the workflows. Uh, one of the things we did with the direct connection was we tried to do as much as we can automatically. Uh, we have some customers, though, that prefer to do things or, or have that tactile feel, so to speak, of being able to click on a button and know definitively uh, that an action has taken place as opposed to allow the system to do things for them automatically. Uh, so with that, one of the things we've added or have added back in are deliberate buttons so that when you're working with a file that is from Windchill, uh, you have the ability to directly, you know, check it in, check it out, undo checkout, uh, those kinds of things. <clears throat> Some of the other things we've done behind the scenes are, uh, there are some updated APIs and whatnot that will help uh, give more information and uh, accelerate you know, how things are displayed and that kind of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you those things. Um, that was my original intent. That's why there's not a lot on this slide. Uh, but uh, rest assured that we are continuing to improve uh, that direct connection. And for those of you that are using it, if there are features and capabilities that do not exist, that you would like to see in it, uh, please let me know. Um, and we will take a look at it and see if there are ways that we can implement that, uh, but still keep this direct connection uh, in a, a simpler form than what the workgroup manager was doing. So next slide, please. Now, one of the other enhancements that we've added is the ability to use Windchill workspaces. And I'm saying windchill workspaces deliberately. So there is not a workspace on your local machine. We are using the workspace in windchill. So there is a local cache. So when you are working on a file in Creo Illustrate using the direct connection, we locally cache the file. When you're just doing normal saves in your progress uh, as you're creating content, we are saving to that local cache. Uh, but then when you close the file or you deliberately say, I want to check this in, uh, things like that, that is when we would actually push the file uh, back up to Windchill to the workspace, if that's where you pulled it from, uh, and you know do the check-in and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this allows you now to be able to 
uh, use the workspace in Windchill, like if you're using the regular web browser interface and you've searched through Windchill, you found what you wanted, you can collect that in your workspace and then be able to directly access that, uh, similar to, you know, kind of having a favorites or a, or a workspace uh, that you've already collected the content that you want to work on. Now, one of the other changes we made here, uh, we got some complaints about when you would go into Windchill using the direct connection, uh, we would take you to the folders first instead of to the context. As you can see in these two images below, the old way we used to do it was we would take you to the folder and then you would go into that structure, but you wouldn't necessarily know the context, whether you were in a library or a project. And if there were library and project folders named the same thing, they would just show up next to each other and you wouldn't necessarily know which was which. So we've changed the structure. So now we show you the context first, so you can decide if you want to go into libraries, products, projects, whatever it is. Then we take you into folders and workspaces and that kind of stuff. So uh, it makes it just a little bit easier to understand where you are in that structure within Windchill uh, without adding you know, too many extra steps. Next, please. So selection set updates. So uh, in the last release, 6.1, we added the concept of selection sets. So this is a capability that allows you to uh, select content or select parts, assemblies, sub-assemblies, that kind of thing, uh, and then name that as a selection set. And it was a rapid way for you to just reselect that name and it would reselect everything that you had selected when you created the selection set. You also have the ability to add more things to your selection set or delete things out of it. And parts could actually be shared across multiple selection sets. Well, one of the things that we got asked for was, this is really great, but I'd like to be able to access those after I publish the content as well. Initially, we only did it as a, a method to help accelerate content creation for the illustrator uh, but now we we have people that want to use it as a downstream capability because you can just call this selection set by name and then modify the visibility or just select it make it highlight you know that kind of stuff so it kind of gives you the ability to uh, you know create kits and things of that nature if you wanted to now this does require that the platform you're delivering on uh, is using, you know, either WebGL or our WebGL, the CreoView WebGL kit, or uh, the CreoView viewer. Uh, I recommend the the WebGL kit, uh, and then your platform would call an API that would allow you to interact with these selection sets. Uh, the other thing that we added here was the ability to create pre-existing names for selection sets. So as part of your standard that you can distribute to all your illustrators, you could actually create pre-built names for selection sets so that they could just add the content that was necessary uh, into that selection set. That way, naming stays consistent. You know, if you have a deliberate intent for a specific selection set by name, uh, then you don't have to worry about people accidentally misspelling it and things of that nature. Uh, one of the other reasons that we added this in uh, was actually if you're delivering content as augmented reality through Vuforia Studio. Uh, in the past, it was not so easy to be able to create a single experience that showed content both sitting on your desktop, so to speak, as well as being overlaid live on the product that you're working on. So with this, you can now create background and tell the viewer to hide the background when you're doing a model target overlay or display the background when you just have this augmented reality sitting on your desktop. Uh, so there are you know, many things that you can do with it, uh, but now you will have the ability to uh, publish those selection sets out and then call those selection sets by name and change the visible properties of that selection set when you're viewing it. So with that, we'll go to the next one. Decals. So uh, again, this 
last release, we added the concept of decal. So in essence, being able to put stickers and whatnot on your parts. Uh, in this release, we've updated decals to include the ability to animate the visibility of a decal. So you're not gonna make the decal move around, although it will move if the part that it's attached to moves. Uh, this is primarily so that like if you've created a, a sequence uh, in the, the sequencer, and in a certain step, you want to make that decal visible. Well, you can now do that. So you can make the decal show up in a step where you want to, in essence, simulate now is when you put the decal on when you're assembling this product, that kind of thing. So again, it doesn't provide movement of the decal. It is purely a visibility. Is it, is it hidden or not? So. Next slide, please. We're going through this really fast without demos. <laughs> um, uh, another decal update is the ability to add decals in the edit structure or you know at the at the bomb structure level. So what this allows you to do, or the original version of decals, you would actually have to add the decal in each figure, uh, which means that even if you put the same decal in, it might not be in exactly the same place and and that kind of thing. Uh, so what we've done here is we've added the ability to apply these decals in edit structure uh, so that it in essence becomes part of the part. And now that just shows up in every figure that you create. You don't have to worry about you know, creating a single figure with the decals and then duplicating that to actually create the content that you wanted to. Uh, you can just go into edit structure. It does require that you have uh, one of the additions that has edit structure active in it, so that's professional and standard. Uh, the Essentials version of Creo Illustrate does not have access to this because it does not have access to the edit structure capability. Um, but you're now able to add decals. You know, you could think about it as a global capability within that Creo Illustrate file uh, so that you can interact and use them in as many figures as you want to create. Uh, inside this Creo Illustrate file. So with that, we will go to the next one. So this one here uh, actually covers a couple of different things. So we are also working on finishing out uh, some of the standards capabilities. So, you know, the, that management uh, and making it easier. So one of the capabilities that we've added is we now have the user interface capability to create uh, page definitions. So you can now create those inside the, the GUI interface as opposed to uh, modifying an XML file. Uh, so it makes it much easier to create as many pages and as many different kinds of pages as you want. And that is part of the standard. So when you uh, export your standard and distribute that to the rest of your users, they will already have these pages uh, pre-built and accessible. Uh, if you need to create new ones, uh, it's much easier to do that. Uh, the other thing we did is we, in essence, did the same type of thing with uh, the light scenes. So for those of you that deliver live 3D and want to be able to better control how the lighting interacts with your parts and whatnot, you can now create custom light scenes and manage those uh, they become part of the standard and those can be distributed as well. So they're, they're much easier to reuse as opposed to having to manually uh, readjust per figure how you want uh, the light scene to show up. All right, go on to the next one. So we are also adding support for MP4 as a video output. So if you are using Creo Illustrate to create sequences or uh, full monolithic animations and whatnot, uh, you can now output those uh, both as an export and as a publish uh, as an MP4 file. Uh, and for those that are not aware, we also added in the prior release the ability to use the page definition to crop you know, what is the height and width that I'm using for these videos? And it even impacts the raster images that you might export. But it allows you to crop that down. Uh, 
But this is basically giving you the ability to output your sequences as a video in a supported, you know, in a web native format uh, to make it a little bit easier to get that content out there without having to do uh, some type of an intermediate step. And next one. Item list export. I know I've been getting requests for this for a long time, uh, and we now have it. So <laughs> for those of you that want to be able to export your item list to include the columns, uh, you now have the ability to do that. So whatever columns you've defined in that parts list or that item list in Creo Illustrate, you can now right click in that item list area, uh, export item list, and it exports as a CSV file. Now we do use for a delimiter, you can set that uh, in the uh, options dialog. If you go in there, you can actually set what the delimiter is. You know, so you've got the, the standard ones, you know, commas, tabs, uh, colon, semicolon, that kind of stuff. Uh, you just need to be careful as anytime you're exporting this type of information, you wanna make sure you're using a delimiter character that is not used in the text like in one of these here, I think it's the second one down, the one that's actually highlighted has a comma in it. So you wouldn't actually want to use a comma as your delimiter, otherwise it's gonna see that as, okay, starting a new column and things just aren't gonna come out right. Uh, but you now have the ability to export out uh, the full item list, even if you have multiple pages of parts. So if you have really long parts lists, uh, you can still export that out as just one file as opposed to multiple individual pages. All right, next one. 